This is a 2001 Jeep Cherokee, better known to car enthusiasts as the XJ Jeep Cherokee, which was its internal model code at Jeep. Now, if you don't know much about cars, you get behind one of these in the road and you think you're just following a regular old used SUV. If you do know about cars, you know there is an obsessive following for these things, and people sometimes get into fights when really clean ones are listed for sale online. Today, I'm going to show you why everyone loves this thing so much. I'll start with style. Now, I've borrowed this XJ Cherokee from my friend Andrew here in Denver, Colorado, and it comes from the final model year, 2001, the most refined of the XJ Cherokees. But it doesn't really matter what year you get. This car came out in 1984, and for 17 years through 2001, it had basically the same design with only minor updates. It was that same characteristic, distinctive, boxy, upright look that this vehicle was so well known for. And that isn't just special to the XJ Cherokee, it's the fact that nobody really makes boxy SUVs anymore. For those of us who don't like our SUVs with flowing lines and sensual curves, like most modern crossovers, that includes me, the XJ Cherokee just represents something you can't get anymore. In fact, I still consider the 2001 Cherokee to the 2002 Jeep Liberty to be the single worst redesign in automotive history. Jeep gave up this gorgeous distinctive styling and a well-known brand name for an ugly new car with an unknown name. Fortunately, Jeep realized the error of their ways. When it came time to redesign the Liberty, they went back to Boxy, and a few years later they dropped the Liberty name altogether and brought back the Cherokee. But it's not just the style. Another reason why XJ Cherokee people love this car is for its simplicity. It has a design rooted in the 1980s with not much that can break or go wrong, not many modern gizmos. Up here, you have a robust four liter straight six that Jeep used for ages, well known for being largely unbreakable and easy to fix when it does break. But it's not just mechanical simplicity that XJ Cherokee people love about this car. This car is just simple in a way that other vehicles just aren't. So today I'm going to show you around the XJ Cherokee and I'm going to show you that simplicity and I'm also going to show you all of the rest of its quirks and features and then I'm going to get it out on the road and see how it drives and then I'm going to give it a Doug score. And for more of my thoughts on the XJ Cherokee, click the link below to visit autotrader.com oversteer where I've also compiled a list of the best preserved 1990s SUVs currently listed for sale on Autotrader. Now I'm going to start with the simplicity, and specifically I'm highly amused by just how much this car you can take apart with a screwdriver or a wrench. It's absolutely incredible. Most new cars, all the little screws are hidden behind little panels or trim pieces, and when you get to them, you have to take out a special tool, and this thing, everything is simple. Take a look just in the cargo area, for example. The little trim piece here has exposed screws all over it. Just take a screwdriver to it, then you can remove the trim piece and replace whatever you need to do. They're everywhere in the cargo area, and that is just an example. A better example are the brake lights. Tail light and brake light removal in cars is usually so cumbersome. You have to get into trim panels and remove various things, and it's always a challenge. In this car, walk up to it, undo those bolts, and then the brake light comes right off. Anybody could remove the brake light and change it in this car. This was also true in the interior of the XJ. Most cars go to such great lengths to hide all the screws to make it seem like everything is seamlessly put together, but this thing, it's almost a point of pride just how much you can take apart with a screwdriver. It's like this car is Lego. Take a look, for example, at the little sill plate. You can just pull that up if it gets too scuffed and put on a new one. There are exposed screws in the doors, the seat rails, everywhere you look. There are exposed screws in this car that you could just take your screwdriver to and go to town. You want to upgrade that part? No problem. It's incredibly easy for people who want to work on a vehicle themselves. But simplicity in this car isn't just about being able to take it apart and put it back together again. It goes far deeper than that. Take a look, for example, at the turn signal stock. I have been in some cars with some really complicated turn signal stocks, and this isn't one of them. You push it down to turn on the turn signal or up, you pull it in for the high beams, that's it. It's just that. 
Also hilarious, Jeep didn't even bother to finish the rear side of the turn signal stalk, so it's not a circle. Everybody else would have gone to the trouble of doing this, but Jeep figured keep it simple, and Cherokee people appreciate that. Also in the vicinity of the turn signal stock, it's worth noting another interesting thing is the gauge cluster. As I get in more newer cars, I notice that gauge clusters are just getting more and more complicated. In large part, I think that's a good thing. You get more and more information without having to take your eyes too far off the road. But just look how simple this one was. You get in this thing and it's almost hard not to be a little nostalgic for when everything was really easy. You just have six gauges, your odometer, and a couple of warning lights. That's pretty much it. Also simple, take a look at the center console in this car. It's just this big piece of gray plastic with three levers sticking out of it. The parking brake, the four-wheel drive lever, and of course the transmission lever, which I've always found kind of funny in this car. It's just a T. It's a post getting it closer to you, and then at the top it's the little part where you push the button in order to shift into gear. No automaker could ever get away with a transmission lever this simple in 2017, but back then it was totally fine. Also, there are molded plastic cup holders, and the whole look of this thing, it isn't beautiful, but it's functional and it's simple. It's funny though, while the simplicity is a big reason why I think people love the Cherokee today, it had a huge impact on the car world in spite of its relatively basic design, and that's another Cherokee quirk. This is ultimately one of the first crossovers, and maybe the very first, the first unibody designed SUV. It was also the very first SUV that kind of taught people you could have an SUV in the suburbs or in the city. Before the Cherokee, SUVs were full-size trucky affairs like the old Chevy Blazer and the Dodge Ram Charger. This was the first smaller, personal-sized one that sort of gave birth to the entire crossover and SUV movement that we have today. Anyway, the Cherokee's quirks go well beyond its simplicity, so time to dive right in. Moving along to the back, something I've always found interesting, on the last couple of years of the XJ Cherokee, Jeep decided to spell out the engine displacement, 4.0 liter, except they spelled liter the British English way of spelling it, ending in RE, so it didn't really make sense considering most of these were sold in the United States. Frankly, I don't think it makes sense to spell out the engine displacement on the back of the car anyway, since most car buying consumers have no idea what a four liter engine is, but they did it and they spelled it wrong. Another interesting quirk around back in the Cherokee, the door handles in this car are rather odd. Instead of grabbing them and pulling them, you have to push a little button and that pops them open and then you can open them. I remember even when I was a kid seeing these on the road, I thought that was kind of strange. The strangest part though is that the door handle in back for the tailgate is normal. So it's not like Jeep didn't know how to make normal door handles, they just, they didn't want to. Next up, another interesting exterior quirk of the Cherokee is just how small this vehicle is. I'm serious. You've normalized this design and its proportions because you've seen thousands of these over the years. But this vehicle is only 167.5 inches long. That makes it over a foot shorter than a modern Honda Civic. Now, obviously, in part, that's because it was designed in a different era, but in part, I also think it's because they just decided to steal a lot of room from the rear passenger. Take a look at the doors. The front door looks normal size. The rear door, I mean, it's so tiny. Look at this, this is like 14 inches of rear door space between the front door and the rear wheel. There's no room back here. Jeep made a two-door version of this, and it's almost like they had to be begrudgingly convinced to also make a four-door version, so they just robbed the rear passengers of all sorts of comfort, and that certainly seems true when you climb in the back seat. The best example of that is not the rear legroom, which clearly is minimal, but actually the fact that there are no rear headrests. And it's not just that the rear headrests have been removed for this one or that they didn't put it in this trim level. There are no rear headrests in the Cherokee. They never offered them. And it wasn't like there hadn't been any research done by the time this came out showing that headrests were tremendously effective at preventing whiplash. That research was already out there. Jeep just didn't want to do it. But Jeep did do one really nice thing for the rear passengers in the Cherokee. Namely, they gave them power windows that could roll all the way down. Now, a lot of people mistakenly believe that rear doors often have windows that don't go all the way down for safety reasons, so your kids can't jump out of the back seats. That's not true. The reason most windows and rear doors don't go all the way down is because they hit the wheel arch, and so they can't go any further 
in the door. Now, Jeep counteracted that by just sticking this giant fixed window that takes up about a third of the window space, and that made the window part that rolls down smaller so that it could roll all the way down. And so if you were riding in the back of a Cherokee, you didn't have a headrest and you didn't have room for your legs, but you could stick your head all the way out the window. Now, another interesting thing about the rear seat in the Cherokee, this isn't a split folding rear seat, so you can fold part of it at once, but the entire bench does fold and it can fold flat so you have a larger cargo area. Interestingly, when you lift up the bottom part of the bench seat in a Cherokee, you'll discover that that is where they placed all the tire equipment you might need to change a tire, the jack and the tire iron. Now, this is a really odd placement for this stuff, and I had to wonder, why did they do this? Why didn't they just stick it under the cargo area floor like every other car? And then I figured it out. It's because there is no under the cargo area floor. Like I said before, this is a small car and Jeep didn't have room under there. Under the cargo area floor is the bottom of the car. And that would explain why back here you have this spare tire. Normally it is placed in that space underneath the cargo area, but not in this car. Instead, they had to stick it here next to the rear window. It's mounted up here. It doesn't just kind of sit here so it could roll around if you get into an accident. And it's not really the best place since it steals some cargo room. Interestingly, Jeep sold a lot of these in the United Kingdom. They sold poster versions with right-hand drive. And when they sold right-hand drive Cherokees, they didn't bother to move the tire. So if you're driving a right-hand drive one, you looked over your shoulder into your blind spot to make a lane change, and what you saw was tire. Not really the best idea, but again, simplicity isn't always our friend. A few other interesting interior quirks worth mentioning in the XJ Cherokee, starting with the stereo. Now, you know how when I review luxury cars, I always talk about how it's cool that the fader, you can just place it using the screen exactly where you want the music to sound best? Well, you can do that in the XJ Cherokee, except it's not a screen, it's a little joystick. You want it slightly over to the left and slightly in the back seat? Well, you can do that. Of course, when you go over bumps, presumably that joystick just gets sent all over the place and the sound goes elsewhere, but it's the thought that counts. Also interesting in the stereo, this stereo has 10 radio presets but you only see five preset buttons, right? Well, check this out. You're listening to preset number one, press it a second time, and now you're listening to preset number six. You're listening to preset number two, press it a second time, and now you're listening to preset number seven. If you tap each preset twice, it turned on the next preset that was sort of hidden from view. And speaking of the stereo, it's worth noting that the center console in this car was rather useful. It had slots for both CDs and cassette tapes. The CD slots are arranged vertically, the cassette tapes are arranged horizontally, but it's worth noting you couldn't do both. If you had CDs in there, then the cassette tape slots weren't usable and vice versa. So you sort of had to pick if you were a CD person or a cassette tape person. Another interesting thing about the stereo in this car, if you're driving along at night, you turn on the headlights, obviously all of the dashboard lights light up like in every car. But if you're driving along in the day and for example, you go into a tunnel, there are three buttons that are always lit on the stereo. Those three are the knobs that adjust bass, mid-range, and treble. Jeep has decided to keep those constantly lit at all times, but not volume or the radio presets or the seek button, just those three, because apparently they thought you'd be adjusting those frequently. It's also worth noting that they have done the same thing over on the driver's door panel for the power window switches, but that makes a lot more sense. You need to look and see those. I'm not really sure why they chose these on the radio. And speaking of weirdly lit things inside this car, in my opinion, the weirdest would be on the sun visors. Now you put the sun visors down there like normal sun visors. You open up the mirror and it's a lighted mirror like in a lot of cars, but in this one, it has a dimmer. So if you want to look at yourself in full brightness, you can, or slightly less brightness or slightly less brightness. It's so weird. This is a car they didn't even install rear headrests and yet there's a dimmer switch on the sun visor mirror. And it's the same on the other side. There's a dimmer switch on both sides, so you could look at yourself in a variety of different light conditions as you drove down the road. Next up, more interesting and unique switch gear. I've always found the hazard light switch to be rather odd in this car. It wasn't a button you push like in every other car. Instead, it was a little switch that you moved to the left, and that turned on the hazard lights. If you wanted to turn it off, 
you moved it back to the right. Interestingly, this was actually fairly common in a lot of older cars, but it's not something you see today. I also always love the window lock button in these. The window switches, the door locks was all fairly normal, but the window lock button, it's like Jeep didn't really know what to do, so they just made it this oval shaped button that says window lock. Push it and the windows are locked so the rear passengers and the front passenger can't roll down their windows. Something else that's interesting, although it's fallen out of favor, a lot of cars at this time had a cigarette lighter and an ashtray, but in the Cherokee, simplicity is key and it was optional. This car doesn't have that option, but it does have a little storage tray about the size of an ashtray. However, unlike an ashtray, you can't pull it out to empty your ashes, so it specifically says no smoking. If you dump your ashes in there, you'll never be able to get them out. You weren't supposed to smoke in this Cherokee. Also interesting is the headlight lever. Now, just like in a lot of older cars, you pull the headlight lever out in order to turn on the headlights. That's not all that unusual if you've been around older vehicles. The unusual thing in this car is that if you turn it all the way to the left, it'll turn on the dome lights. You have to know about that. It doesn't say that anywhere, but if you know about it and you want to turn on your dome lights, you can do it with the headlight switch. Finally, in the glove box of this Cherokee, you will find something rather interesting. That would be the original owner's manual, and it has a couple of interesting quirks all onto its own. For example, the pouch that it came in. It doesn't say Jeep or even Jeep Cherokee. Instead, it says Daimler Chrysler Corporation, just a reminder of the giant merged company that sold you this car. Interesting to me, on the outside of the owner's manual, it doesn't have a picture of the vehicle or even the Jeep logo. It's just sort of like a picture of Utah. You want to take this thing out, that's somewhere you can go with it. But there's no picture of the car there, so you probably had to park it at the visitor center and then walk to get this picture. And the final interesting owner's manual item, I have the owner's manual out right now, and on page 184, it tells you what causes rust and corrosion. Now, it gives five causes. Take a second and think about what you think causes rust and corrosion. What Jeep says causes it are the following. Number one, road salt, dirt, and moisture accumulation, of course. Number two, salt in the air near ocean localities, obviously. Number three, stone and gravel impact, also true. Numbers four and five are a little unusual. Four is insects, tree sap, and tar. Insects cause rust. And finally, number five, atmospheric fallout. So if you don't want your Cherokee to rust, keep it away from atmospheric fallout and insects and the normal causes of rust. And so those are the quirks and features of the XJ Jeep Cherokee, and now it's time to get it out on the road and see how it drives. Now, unfortunately, I won't be able to take this thing off-road, but it's worth noting that that's another thing that people love about the XJ Cherokee, just how easily it can be modified to go deep off-road. This car had serious four-wheel drive systems, far better than what you'll get in your normal Ford Escape or Hyundai Tucson. One reason nice XJ Cherokees are so sought after when they're listed for sale online is that people are always looking for a good starting place for an off-road build. And if you go on Jeep forums, you will see that the sky is the limit for how far and how severely you can modify these to tackle the trails. But anyway, now it's time to see how this thing performs on-road. All right, driving the XJ Cherokee. Now, the first thing I notice uh, while I'm driving this thing is that the steering feels heavy and the car feels more substantial than I expected. In terms of the steering feel and everything, it almost feels like a midsize or a larger uh, SUV. I love driving these old boxy SUVs, looking out, and you just see everything everywhere. Uh, I made fun of the no headrest, but there is a benefit to them. In fact, there's a safety benefit. I can just see for days behind me. I mean, it's almost unbelievable because there's no headrest there to impede my vision and because all of the windows are massive in this car. And of course, that's probably on the backs of the fact that there's no side airbags or anything like that. But the, the reality is when you look around, you can just see and see and see. Uh, now, I'm not about to say that this car is fast. It is under no circumstances fast. It's not quick. Uh, it's not really anything of the sort. It does have a little low end torque and some pep. They've obviously tuned the accelerator when you press it to kind of respond instantly. So it kind of gets going quickly, but uh, this car is not a vehicle with a lot of passing power. The ride quality isn't as bad as I was expecting. Uh, it, it, it's not great, but it absorbs bumps better than I would expect considering this thing was engineered, you know, in the early mid 1980s. Now, I like the heavy steering. Uh, a lot of people prefer light steering, easier to turn the wheel, whatever. 
Uh, I like cars where they have heavier steering. It is surprisingly not vague. The on-center vagueness is there, uh, but when I'm turning, it's predictable, uh, it's linear. And one reason I really like this car, and another reason I think people like this car, is the size. Uh, it's just smaller. Um, SUVs have just gotten larger and larger, and, and, and obviously, you know, with that, there have been vast improvements in, in fuel economy, so you can get a larger SUV without trading gas mileage. And there are all these safety improvements that have made vehicles larger, crumple zones, that sort of thing. However, some people just like smaller, you know, vehicles, and this one is just so immensely maneuverable and parkable uh, and drivable in all situations, and I really like that, and I think a lot of people really like that. Surprisingly composed in terms of road noise and tire noise. I'm actually surprised. Don't hear the road really, don't hear tires, don't hear other cars. It's pretty good in that sense. What it is not composed is engine noise. It's actually quite surprising to me how much engine gets into the cabin. Maybe you can hear. You don't get that kind of engine noise in modern vehicles. It's also hard not to like the simplicity. I'm actually someone, a lot of car enthusiasts are like, oh, I hate all technology and screens. I'm actually someone who likes the, the screens and I like all the new features and I like trying them out and I like using them and I think they're often very useful. Some are too much, but many of them are very useful. Um, however, you can't get in one of these and not, oh, remember when I didn't have to, you know, press a screen to change the climate controls or, you know, I wanted to see my odometer. I didn't have to go through several different menus. You know, I, I think that a lot of these things are progress but at the same time you get in a car like this and you're like, boy, yeah, times were simpler back then. And so that's the famous XJ Jeep Cherokee. People love the simplicity, which isn't really available anymore. People love the boxy styling, which isn't really available anymore. People love the small size and the off-road prowess, which is getting harder and harder to find. And frankly, people just love Jeeps and the XJ Cherokee was a quintessential Jeep. It was also a huge factor in a lot of people's childhoods on account of the fact that Jeep had it on sale for basically two decades. You know, this is a 2001 model from the final model year. It's been 16 years since you could buy one of these as a new car, and yet they're still highly desirable, highly sought after, especially XJ Cherokees in good condition. And it's hard to believe there will ever be a time when that's not the case. And with that in mind, on to the Doug score. Starting with the weekend categories and styling, I love the boxy design and I don't care what you say, I'm giving it a 7 out of 10. It's an icon. Next up is acceleration and I don't know what the exact 0-60 to 60 figure is, but it's over 7 seconds and thus it gets a 1 out of 10. Handling is fine, predictable and not dangerous, but it's not even slightly sporty and it gets a 3 out of 10. Cool factor is debatable, but I personally think these things are cool and only getting cooler as nice ones are becoming rarer and it gets a 5 out of 10. Importance, however, is bigger. This is a significant car to the car industry, to SUVs, to Jeeps, and to a lot of North Americans, and it easily gets a 7 out of 10, bringing the total weekend score to 23 out of 50. Next up are the daily categories, starting with features. The XJ Cherokee has all the essentials, but nothing more, and it gets a 3 out of 10. Comfort is okay, not great, but not too harsh, and it gets a 4 out of 10. Quality is a mixed bag. The Cherokee is notoriously reliable, but no one would exactly call this car nice, like a luxury car, so I'm giving it a 6 out of 10. Practicality, it has 69 cubic feet of cargo space, earning it a 9 out of 10. Finally, there's value. If you act fast when you see one listed, you can still buy a nice XJ Cherokee for around 10 grand, which is a good deal for an automotive icon, especially one that's ideally sized for city driving and just as comfortable on off-road trails. It gets an 8 out of 10, bringing its total daily score to 30 out of 50. Add it all up and the total Doug score is 53 out of 100, which isn't too bad for a 16-year-old SUV you can get for under 10 grand, even if it doesn't have rear headrests.